Mr. Ambassador, thank you for agreeing to serve your nation once again, and congratulations. Let's be clear, the reaction overall of the administration has been pathetic. And the risk that the United States faces, its reputational risk, the risk of, uh, of intelligence gathering, the risk of the Chinese assessing our very air defenses and alertness is a very serious issue. Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Michael Duffy, opinions editor at large here at The Post. Our guest this morning is John Bolton, former UN ambassador to the UN, former national security advisor, and a top official in both the Justice and the State Departments. He's been with us before. Welcome back, Ambassador. Glad to be with you. Thanks for having me. Let's go on the news immediately. Calling this morning for dialogue and negotiation, China earlier today suggested a ceasefire between Moscow uh, in Ukraine. Uh, can you start by describing uh, what the relationship is at the moment between China and Russia? Is it an alliance? What, what would you call it? Well, I've called it an entente previously. I think it's growing closer all the time. I think uh, in, if it continues at its present pace, it will be an axis before too much longer. Uh, a lot of so-called experts have said that China was dismayed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They were trying to separate themselves from uh, the Kremlin. Uh, I think we've seen in recent days proof positive that's not uh, true. I don't think it has been true. I think China has been uh, increasing its purchases of Russian oil and gas significantly to make up for the sanctions the West imposed. I think there's no doubt that sanctioned Russian financial institutions have been laundering money through the opaque Chinese banking system. And now even the Biden administration admits China may be contemplating direct uh, provision of weapons to Russia. This Chinese peace plan, if it wasn't drafted side by side with Russia, was certainly cleared with Russia before it was released. And I have to say, I took a shot at predicting what it would look like after I heard uh, at Munich that the Chinese were going to propose it. Uh, and I think in, in broad strokes, uh, it is what I was worried about, which is ostensibly it looks even handed, uh, but it's a real uh, product of moral equivalence. It treats the aggressor the same way as it treats the victim. Uh, and the terms, as, uh, as I read through the uh, Chinese diplomatic language, give a distinct advantage to Russia. So to be clear, I think China's in this with both feet on Russia's side. And while I certainly don't diminish the threat that China poses to Taiwan and countries in East and South Asia, I would say the most threatened country in the world today from China is Ukraine. Uh, earlier this week also, Vladimir Putin uh, suspended the New START Treaty. Uh, I think that was on Tuesday or Monday or Tuesday of this week. Uh, in your view, is that uh, a challenge to the U.S. or is that an opportunity? It's a blessing. I wish he had withdrawn entirely. Uh, the New START Treaty was a bad deal in 2010 when the Senate ratified it. It hasn't gotten any better with age. The Biden administration made a huge mistake in 2021 in extending it for five years without any concessions uh, on the part of the Russians. Uh, look, the treaty uh, originally and today doesn't consider tactical nuclear weapons at all, in which Russia has a great advantage. Uh, the treaty is outdated. Uh, because of new technology like hypersonics. And most importantly of all, it's a Cold War relic. It's a bipolar uh, treaty uh, reflecting what was the bipolar nuclear world of uh, the Cold War. 
Today, as China, by the way, refuses to engage in strategic arms control negotiations, rapidly building up uh, its nuclear capability, uh, there, it's, if there's going to be any arms control agreements at all, if they're not tripolar, they don't make any sense. But even more importantly than that, I hope this is a wake-up call for people to begin to understand that in a uh, three-major-party nuclear world, all of the calculations, all of the nuclear strategy we followed in a bipolar world during the Cold War are out the window. We had comparable capabilities to the Soviets in the Cold War. Now we've got two adversaries uh, that may act separately or they may act together. So if China has X amount of nuclear warheads deployed, Russia has the same amount, and then we have the same amount, who's most at risk? We are. So I think what this should provoke is a, uh, a massive rethinking of our own nuclear doctrine. Before we get into any more arms control agreements, let's make sure we have enough arms to protect ourselves and through extended nuclear deterrence, our allies. Let's go back to Ukraine for a minute, Ambassador. Uh, earlier this week, Secretary of State Tony Blinken said he expected the Chinese might soon provide military aid, uh, greater military aid to Russia. Um, uh, what do you expect that to be? What weapons uh, would make a difference in that conflict coming from China? Well, I think uh, we shouldn't assume that China hasn't already been providing weapons directly or indirectly, helping North Korea, for example, ship uh, weapons and ammunition to Russia, helping Iran ship drones, finding weapons in third world countries that uh, perhaps Russia had sold to them originally that the Chinese could help transport back, uh, providing intelligence to Russia and that sort of thing. Uh, it, this is, though, uh, that the administration now acknowledges this, uh, demonstrates that China has a real stake here uh, in how this turns out. I think so far, China's been the big winner of the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, and I think it's watching very carefully what we do, what the NATO alliance does, and, and making appropriate judgments about what potential Chinese military activity, whether against Taiwan or others, might be. But it, it gives the lie to the idea that sort of you have a China problem over here and you have a Russia-Ukraine problem over there. Uh, it's, a, it's a big, complicated world. China and Russia are increasingly uh, in, a, in a closer relationship, which is it's going to end up bad for the Russians by the end of the century, but it's bad for us uh, and Europe and Asia right now. Uh, at this stage of the uh, conflict between Moscow and Kyiv, uh, would you favor sending additional weapons? And if so, which ones? Sure, I'd favor sending a lot of weapons, but with all due respect, I think that's the wrong question. We've had arguments one after the other. Do we ship this weapon system? Do we ship HIMARS? Do we give them attackums? Do we provide tanks? Do we provide F-16s? Let's ask the more basic question. What are American objectives here? It's the stated position of the United States that Ukraine should be returned to full territorial integrity and sovereignty. Do we believe that? I don't think the government does believe that. This morning, the Secretary of Defense was asked that question, and he said, well, we're going to leave that to Ukraine to decide. Uh, I don't think it's in America's interest to do that. I don't think it's in Ukraine's interest to do that. The alliance that's supporting Ukraine ought to be convergent with Ukraine on what the goals are. Then when we know what the goals are, you can strategize, that is to say, assemble uh, the weapons systems, the the assets that we need to have to achieve the strategy. Arguing about one weapon system after another just tell the tells the Russians in advance what we're thinking of and doesn't contribute to a coherent strategy. Time is not on our side on this thing. Are we content to have this war drag on for 10 years, five years? How much longer do you want the war to go on? How much greater risk to the Ukrainians do you want? How much more cost to the United States? Let's have a strategy not to fight a war on and on and on, but a strategy to help Ukraine win. Well, um, let me just push a little bit, because uh, would you favor sending the kinds of weapons that would enable Ukraine to retake Crimea, for example, to strike into Russia, for example? Are those are those decisions you would take as president? A absolutely. Do we believe in the full restoration of sovereignty and territorial integrity for Ukraine or do we not? Uh, Let's ask the question, who started this war? Who, who escalated it to military levels? The Russians did. 
Um, and, and yet we would say to the Ukrainians, you, you can't uh, go after targets on your own sovereign territory. What, what exactly is the logic there? You know, the Russians have been intimidating the Biden administration and others in NATO uh, by, in effect, uh, implying that the, they might escalate the war. Well, they escalated the war when they invaded to start with. But I also asked the question, what would they escalate it with? Where is the hidden army that they're going to use to escalate this war? The British Secretary of Defense said 97% of Russia's army is already engaged in Ukraine. The only escalation that would leave them would be nuclear. And I think uh, we should be thinking and acting to deter that possibility very seriously by telling Putin that he would be signing his death warrant uh, if that happened. Uh, some, some may be a little shocked at that. I'm, I'm happy to consider other suggestions for more effective deterrence against the use of nuclear weapons. But we've been intimidated by Russia during the course of this war uh, over the past year. Uh, and it's permitted the Russians through uh, just the most incredibly poor military performance, far poorer than anybody on our side expected, still to be in the contest, still to have a gridlock on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, this this is not a formula for winning and therefore bringing the war to a conclusion at the earliest time uh, and minimize the human cost and the economic cost. Do you think Vladimir Putin has a trip, a nuclear tripwire in Ukraine or not? Well, I think there are certain circumstances under which I think he would uh, consider using nuclear weapons, probably if Russian forces on the battlefield collapsed totally and were in uh, uncontrolled flight back toward the Russian border, uh, and or if his own political position in Russia were on the verge of uh, complete collapse. I don't think that's the point we're at now, but it would be in more extreme circumstances than we've had so far. His references to nuclear weapons over the past year, according to open testimony by uh, U.S. intelligence officials, have been pure bluff. There's been no change in the deployment of uh, Russian nuclear forces following those comments by Putin, no evidence that it was anything but rhetoric. One more question on Ukraine. With the what you call the apparent axis between Beijing and Moscow, does that put you, the conflict in Ukraine itself uh, in a new phase? I don't think it's a new phase. I think it's uh, perhaps the growing awareness that it's always been this way. This is a global war. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese are in this together. The Chinese have, from the beginning, politically and I think militarily, had Russia's back. And the concomitant uh, uh, other side of that is that if China, for example, were to uh, try to attack Taiwan or throw a blockade around it, they would expect Russia to have their back. So the, the growing relationship between the two of these countries really goes back in a way to er the earliest days of the Cold War, although the positions uh, of the two countries are obviously 180 degrees the opposite. China is the dominant partner here and will be for the rest of the century. The only real question, I think, is how much of a vassal state uh, Russia is going to become if the current trends continue. You were briefed, I think, last week by the Biden administration on uh, what happened uh, with respect to the uh, Chinese surveillance balloon that crossed into U.S. airspace and was shot down, uh, including on what might have been seen during your time in office in the Trump administration. What can you tell us about that meeting? Did you learn anything? Yeah, I thought the meeting, which was conducted by uh, intelligence officials from, from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, there were no political appointees in the room. I thought it was a, a professional and, and, uh, and well done briefing and, and very helpful. Uh, I came away from that meeting. Obviously, there's nothing I can say about it. I'm, I'm a private citizen now. Unlike the Biden administration, I can't selectively declassify uh, what, what I heard. But uh, I think that. Uh, that this is uh, th this whole balloon incident uh, really is a wake up call uh, for us to look at whether uh, we need capabilities approaching what this Chinese balloon was apparently doing. You know, in time of crisis or time of war, uh, we and our adversaries would look at destroying our satellites in space, the ones that can take pictures of the Earth, the ones that can intercept 
electronic communications that provide communications uh, for our military to blind those capabilities in space. And it may well be this balloon uh, is a capability that uh, it's not as good as having the satellites up there, but if your satellites have been taken out, this may be at least some small recompense, some way of getting uh, overhead uh, uh, in a particular country at, at a time of crisis. So I think I think that's what we ought to look at going forward, uh, and uh, and try and do this hard as it is in Washington today uh, on a bipartisan basis. To me, it's another signal that we need a significant increase in our defense and intelligence budget. Uh, I'm, I'm a I'm a deficit hawk myself. I want to get the budget deficit down, but military and intelligence budgets are going to have to go up. And so that hard political reality is that domestic spending is going to have to come down even more. Was there a part of U.S. airspace that they that the Chinese have been exploiting that uh, we are not exploiting in return? Well, I think this balloon uh, capability somewhere between 60 and 80 thousand feet, as I say, it has certain advantages. Uh, we, we wouldn't need it if the satellites were still up there. But if the satellites were destroyed, uh, th that that is one alternative. We also still have the U-2. Uh, and uh, there may be other capabilities as well. But I think uh, looking at a potential crisis or, or hostility context, uh, uh, recognizing that our satellites are vulnerable, uh, we, we need some way to hedge against the complete loss of that capability. You'd said on the record before the briefing that you were 100 percent certain that no balloons had entered U.S. airspace while you were in office in the Trump administration. Is that still your position after the briefing? Well, I think I said I was 100% certain nobody had told us that the balloons had entered. And I don't want to get into the specifics of it, uh, unlike some people in the administration, because because that I think that would reveal more to the Chinese than we want. Uh, but there are always in, increases and improvements we can make in our detection capabilities and in our assessment and better coordination among uh, our intelligence agencies and, uh, uh, and capabilities. I, I think the mistake here... Uh, though, was a mistake of policy. I think when this 200-foot-high balloon was sent, as the administration itself said, from the time it was launched from Hainan Island, south of the Chinese mainland, all the way up to Alaska, that that was enough evidence to have said to the Chinese, you've got one of your balloons coming our way, and you either turn it around or we're going to shoot it down. And we should have done that before it crossed uh, over our shores, over onto uh, mainland Alaska. We should not have let it go any further than that. Last question on the balloons. What what was it they were actually looking at? In your well, I don't, I don't yeah, I, <laughs> I don't think we know for sure. I think that mission could have had uh, uh, a number of uh, rationales for it. You know, one administration theory floated to show that uh, uh, happy times are here again was maybe the balloon had just been you know blown off course. Uh, well, OK, if we'd called the Chinese up and said your balloon is off course, if you have directional capability, you should exercise it right now. I don't uh, know of any evidence that we did that. But but part of the Chinese uh, uh, feeling, e even if the balloon was blown off course, is let's let's see if it drifts over the United States. Let's see if they find it. And if they do find it, let's see what they do with it. And And what they found was we let the thing just pass across the United States. Now, uh, that was a decided underreaction by the administration. It may be later we we shot down Mrs. Smith's high school science class balloon uh, as an overreaction. Uh, but but the fact is, when a large unidentified object is heading toward the United States from a policy point of view, the presumption ought to be it's dangerous. Doesn't mean shoot first and ask questions later. But if you're not getting any response in this case from China, where it came from, yes, I would shoot it down. OK. And lastly, uh, you called uh, for bipartisan action on this front going forward. What what do you mean by that? What what do you want to see happen and how can both parties do it? Well, I think there should be a greater appreciation when you consider uh, everything in the international environment today that we are in a much more threatening period than we have been in a long time. The largest land war in Europe since World War II is underway as we speak. We've got uh, China uh, interjecting itself into it, China threatening along its uh, Indo-Pacific periphery, China sending balloons over the United States 
uh, Iran and North Korea still making progress on their nuclear weapons programs. We need a much stronger defense posture. We need a much larger defense budget. Uh, and I would hope that somewhere, even in the Democratic Party, there's still a Scoop Jackson wing. Uh, and I hope that uh, the isolationist resurgence in the Republican Party uh, doesn't go any further, because this is a moment when uh, we may be able to act before the threat metastasizes even uh, more, more extensively than it has so far. You saw that earlier this week, uh, the U.S. the Pentagon decided to increase mo very modestly uh, troop presence in Taiwan, mostly with trainers. Um, how would you describe the current U.S. position on Taiwan? Well, I think it's uh, it, it's it's getting better. I think that deployment was a correct decision, but I think there's a lot more to do, and I think uh, we have to assume that time is short given the. Uh, given what, what China has been saying, given the preparations it's been making, uh, I think there has to be a lot more, not simply in uh, increasing uh, Taiwan's uh, military capabilities, but also showing increased uh, uh, American support. I think the time for strategic ambiguity over Taiwan is gone. Uh, I would suggest home porting American naval vessels at Kaohsiung Harbor in uh, southern Taiwan. Uh, putting more Americans in to train and assist Taiwanese forces, uh, and over the long term, which isn't wasn't all that long, but in in over the next several years, uh, recognizing that uh, Taiwan is an independent country, I, I recommended in the year 2000 we extend full diplomatic recognition to Taiwan. I think we should do it today, and I think we should begin to integrate Taiwan into more uh, elaborate collective. Uh, uh, defense organizations in, in East and South Asia with Japan, South Korea, Australia, and others, uh, because the more Taiwan is linked in with others who worry about China's belligerence, uh, the greater the chance that we can deter any uh, uh, Chinese menace toward Taiwan. Is it your assumption that the U.S. Uh, public would support uh, uh, the U.S. defending Taiwan against a Chinese invasion? Is there enough public support for that now? Well, I think there is, but this is also what political leadership is all about. If, if you explain to the American people the threats we face, the threats our allies face, the threats those represent to the way we live here at home, and that steps need to be taken, uh, not out of acts of charity or uh, humanitarianism, but for cold, hard American national security interests, uh, I think the American people will respond to it. I think part of our problem for uh, a good long period here, 15 years, uh, if not more, is that American leaders have not been willing to talk about the hard reality in the outside world to the people. And uh, when, when that happens, it's a natural reaction for people to say the threats are not there when they are there. So political leaders have to uh, pick up their socks here and, uh, and, and be clearer with the American people. Uh, you have said you are weighing a presidential run in 2024. Tell us why. Well, I had not originally intended uh, anything like that this year. I did look uh, seriously at that in 2016 and uh, ultimately concluded not to run. Uh, I was really prompted this year uh, when uh, Donald Trump said the Constitution should be terminated. Uh, uh, so that he could be declared the winner of the 2020 election. You know, I've, I've filled out a lot of security application forms over time, and there's always a question on there somewhere like, uh, have you ever advocated the overthrow of the government of the United States? And I've always dutifully checked no. But when you say terminate the Constitution, that sounds like overthrowing the government. That is not a conservative or a Republican position. So it didn't surprise me that Trump would say it. I was disappointed at the lack of a real uh, uh, clear rejection of that by uh, Republicans considering running. And I felt that uh, uh, somebody ought to, ought to be saying that. Now, if I, if I did decide to run, it would not be as a one-issue candidate. It would be to win. And uh, I fully understand from having looked at it before in my uh, experience in politics over the years. It's a very arduous decision. I wouldn't take it lightly. I'm still looking at it now. Uh, you have, of course, broken with former President Trump rather dramatically. Uh, have you been surprised by his progress uh, and his prospects so far this year? What do you make of his chances? Well, I don't think his chances are very high. Uh, and I think they're diminishing day by day. 
uh, I think uh, the elections this past November for many people were a red flag that uh, showed that with Trump's influence in the party, even to the extent it is, could cripple our ability to win the White House in 2024 and, and finish off any chance uh, uh, to take control of the center of the House. I think that's caused uh, Trump's support to decline. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens in coming days. I, I must say the continued adherence to Trump, notwithstanding everything that, uh, that, that has happened in, 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 uh, after January 6th in particular, but this continued adherence to Trump and the idea that he should get the party's nomination make this really the longest act of attempted suicide by a political party in history. Turning away from Trump is the future of the party. Uh, is it not not the opposite? What to what do you attribute that continued adherence? I presume you mean by voters, Republican voters. Well, I think I think there's a a, a feeling that Trump's against the people we're against, and that's uh, that that's what attracts people. What I would like to do is win elections with conservatives, real conservatives, uh, and uh, change policy in the government. Trump doesn't have a philosophy. Uh, he's centered on Donald Trump. He certainly did many things. Republicans uh, support the his appointments to the judiciary is a good example. But ask yourself the question, what other Republican candidate for the nomination would do anything other than what Trump did on judicial appointments? In other words, there's nothing about Trump that makes it any better than, than anyone else on the things people say they like about his policies. Uh, I think he's not fit to be president, and that's certainly a point I would not be afraid to make if I got in the race. You know, the world uh, uh, is in a very different place today than it was in 2016 with both Ukraine and China and Russia. Um, a question we have uh, from the audience, a man named Cesar in Florida asks, since there is a possibility that President Trump could be reelected, how do you think he will manage our country's relationship with Ukraine and Russia. You were there at his side, Ambassador. Um, this is a different set of facts on the ground today. How would he handle it? Well, I, I know what he said in the past few weeks. He said if he could get Zelensky and Putin in a room together, he could solve the problem in 24 hours. This is delusional. Uh, and it's, it's unfortunately typical of Trump's approach to things. Uh, the worst part of the Trump administration to me on national security grounds were the enormous opportunities that we missed because he couldn't, couldn't keep focused on a policy for a sustained period of time. And I think if he came back, uh, probably uh, it would be even worse than it was then. I, I said uh, uh, in, in my book, and I, I believe and believe again today, if he were elected again, I think he would uh, withdraw from NATO. I think that would be a catastrophe. What, uh, a quick domestic policy question, since you said you were running across the board. Um, where are you on the question of protecting Social Security and Medicare? President Trump has said he wouldn't touch them. Some members of Congress have said in the past it's time to take a look. Uh, where do you come down? I, I think it is uh, fiscally insane not to look at reforms of Social Security and Medicare. I think this concept of entitlement programs uh, itself is a bad idea. It, it is a session of power by Congress of enormous importance. Uh, they don't vote annually on how much is going to be spent on these programs. That's why they're called entitlements. Uh, that whole concept should be rejected. Uh, and I think that one way to uh, to help people understand that is to begin to look at reforms uh, that try and impose some kind of fiscal responsibility on them. I understand this is not popular politically, but I think this is what uh, political leadership is all about. And I think it's a big mistake for the Republican Party to, to fall prey to rhetoric, uh, whether it's from the Democrats or their new ally, Donald Trump. Last question, I hope. The, the uh, Republican race for president, you're not in it alone. Nikki Haley, the, another former ambassador to the UN, is in the race. You have referred to her uh, as light as a feather uh, and were subsequently grilled about that. Um, what happened to the Republicans' 11th commandment, thou shalt speak no ill of other Republicans? Is that just a, a relic now? Or, 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 and and, and wh what's your policy toward others in this race? Right. Well, light as a feather was a quotation in my book from Mike Pompeo. Uh, and I might say also in my book, Donald Trump said about Nikki Haley, she's not a student, you know. 
um, look, this this is what people have said, and uh, uh, I, I think everybody's subject to criticism, uh, male or female, uh, and uh, we'll we'll let the voters decide. I'd, I'd love to go back to the eleventh commandment, uh, and uh, as soon as Donald Trump agrees to that, I'm sure the party will jump right into it. Ambassador Bolton, thanks so much for joining us today. We're out of time. It's always great to see you and hope to have you back soon. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. And thanks to you for joining us. I'm Michael Duffy, opinions editor at large here at The Post. To learn more about what's coming up on Washington Post Live, go to our website and look at the future programs. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good afternoon.